Okay, good afternoon. I think it's time to get started. There are still a few people joining, I can see, but I think the majority is here. And it's four o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, this webinar uh, is about PDF Pilots, uh, PDF 8 Pilot 7. It should not be overly long. I think it will take between 30 minutes and 45 minutes, but we will uh, see, I guess. Let's get uh, started with this. Uh, PDFA Pilot 7 is a major new version of PDFA Pilots, and there are two main topics that I want to talk about here. That doesn't mean those are the only new things in PDFA Pilots, but uh, those are the two main ones that we've selected here to talk about. The first one is uh, Vera PDF, what that is and what that means for PDFA Pilots. And the second one talk is about decorating PDF documents. So let's start with the first one, which might be a little bit new to some people, um, and that is Vera PDF. And Vera PDF is an initiative from the uh, from Europe, the European Community, um, and it is uh, part of a project that is called Preforma uh, or Preservation Formats. And that is not just about PDFA, it is also about TIFF, it's about video. So the formats that the European community is using to archive documents for uh, the long term. And the, the target of the PDFA part of that uh, project, of Vera PDF, was to create an open source PDF validation tool and a very broad one. So all parts of the PDFA standard, all conformity levels of the PDFA standard. If you're in doubt, the parts refer to the version, PDFA 1, 2, 3, and the conformity levels refer to which flavor of that level a file is conformant to. You have PDFA 1, a, you have PDF A, 1B. So all of those need to be covered by this uh, Vera PDF uh, project. The Vera PDF project was done by the Vera PDF consortium. They won the, the project around building this open source PDF validation tool. And the Vera PDF consortium consists out of the PDF Association and the Open Preservation Foundation. Once more, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about um, a project where the goal was to write an open source validator to make a um, and to make a test set that can be used to validate whether a particular piece of software complies to all of the rules, requirements, limitations that are to be found in the PDFA format. Yeah. So if you look at the results of this project, what came out is in fact an open source validator. And I'll give you some more details about that. It is a test corpus, which is a set of test files um, that can be used to validate all of the requirements in uh, PDFA. And then it is a tech note written by the PDF Association to clarify some of the decisions taken in this whole uh, process. So let's start with the um, open source validator. Uh, you can actually test this yourself. There is an online validator that you can find at demo.verapdf.org, or you can either download a compiled version or download the sources. It is open source, meaning that you can download all of the sources and see how this is uh, put together. And of course, for a project like this, when we talk about validation and we talk about uh, a quite important process to validate that files are compliant to long-term uh, archival standards, then the fact that this is open source is really important because it means that anyone can see how the validation is done and can make sure that what happens in this open source validator is actually correct. Now, at the moment, there is a version 1.2 of this validation tool. The final tool will be there in June 2017. And of course, there will be ongoing 
maintenance after that as well. Why is it important to have this uh, open source validator? That's a very good question because there are quite a number of validators already in, from different companies, from all over the world. Uh, there is software to validate that a PDF document is compliant with PDF A or not. Uh, of course, when you have software written by different vendors, it typically means that the results may differ a little bit. And that's the importance, the main importance of the uh, open source initiative. It is to have one definitive piece of software of which the result is assumed to be correct. And if at some point it is found that uh, the open source tool would not be correct, the community around it uh, can discuss and, and decide to update the, the validator. But it, it gives kind of a golden standard, if you want, of uh, a PDF, uh, a validator. It's a standard that can arbitrate when there are differences between other software applications uh, that uh, validate against PDF A. This uh, Vera PDF project is only for validation. It doesn't do any fixing or correction or conversion or anything like that. It is pur purely focused on uh, validation. And it also means that it could be used for additional validation after PDF A conversion. So if you have um, a native application like Word, that claims to be able to write a PDFA document, you could use the open source validator to validate that that is indeed the case. If you are building a project with a commercial tool, such as PDFA Pilot, that can batch convert um, uh, PDF files into PDFA or Office files into PDFA, then this Vera PDF validator is an independent validation that you can do at the back end of that to make sure that the files produced by PDFA pilots are in fact uh, in conformance with the, uh, the standard. The second part of this project, uh, as I said, is a test corpus. And with test corpus, we mean a set of files to do testing with. Now, there already was one on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, you see the Isartor test suite. And the Isartor test suite contains 204 fail tests for PDF A1B. And a fail test means that it, it, it's a test file that contains something that is not allowed in a PDF A1B. So if you take this test file and you run it through PDF A pilot, for example, validating against PDF A1B, then there should be an error reported. That's a fail test. Now, what was done in the Vera PDF test corpus is um, a lot more extensive, and you can see that. Uh, not only is the number of test files that was added significantly higher, it actually incorporates also all the test files from the Isartor test suite, but this test corpus not only contains fail um, PDF files, so PDF files that are incorrect, it also contains pass PDF files, PDF files that are actually good, which means that if you process all of the files in that test set, uh, you should get specific files that say I'm good and other files that report an error. And both of those need to happen correctly, of course. Um, a, a validator could um, incorrectly pass an, a, a fail file, and that's a problem because it doesn't see a potential problem. but a validator could also be wrong in the other direction. It could take a good file and say that it is not PDFA, and that's also not a good thing. So that's why you have fail and pass tests in this uh, Vera PDF test corpus. And when you when you look at it from a, a software vendor point of view, uh, the view uh, point of view of Kalas, for example, who creates PDFA Pilot and PDF Toolbox, then this test set is perhaps the 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 biggest value there is in this Vera PDF uh, project because it gives you a target to test the software against. And that, of course, is exactly what happened as well. Um, the, uh, the software that is on the market today was tested against those test files 
in that test corpus. And out of that um, came a lot of discussion, of course. Uh, if vendor A does something different than vendor B, or if two vendors do something different than uh, what the very PDF open source validator does, then there needs to be some kind of arbitration. Someone needs to decide how the PDF standard um, is to be interpreted and what is wrong and what is right. That was done by the uh, PDF Association. There were a number of working groups in the uh, or working meetings in the PDF Association where uh, differences were discussed and where uh, a number of experts came to a conclusion on what was good and what was not good, how the PDF A standard should be interpreted. In total, there were 29 uncertainties that uh, were identified and that were written into a tech note. And that is this tech note 10 that you see um, here. So uh, there is at the moment not a final version yet, but it's in final vote uh, at the PDF Association. Um, this tech note summarizes the discussion on all of these uncertainties that were found when the Vera PDF um, validator was compared to the results of uh, all the other PDFA validators that were on the market already. So this tech note for each of these points discusses what the problem is um, and says what the conclusion is of all of the technical discussions that have taken place. In other words, in case of doubt, this tech note can tell you how the PDFA standard should be interpreted. Now, something like this leads to changes in PDFA Pilot, and that was one of the reasons for PDFA Pilot 7, because um, just as other PDFA software, some things had to be adjusted to be in compliance with the findings of this VR PDF project. And what we found for PDFA pilots is that none of the changes that were required were critical. Uh, typically, they were smaller things that had to be adjusted. And there are some examples here. Uh, one example is that uh, when you talk about XMP, XMP metadata in PDF files, XMP can contain simple types and structure types. The conclusion in uh, the tech note was that structure types in XMP metadata should not be checked. That's something that uh, had to be changed in PDFA Pilot because PDFA Pilot did it differently. Another uh, example is, uh, and it's a, a rather technical one, but there is something called soft masks in PDF. It's part of the PDF specification. And a soft mask should actually always use device gray. Um, even if device gray by itself is not allowed, not always allowed uh, by the PDFA standard. So this is an exception, and the exception is there because the soft mask is a very um, particular, very specific uh, object, and it needs device gray in order to work correctly. So that's another change to the checking uh, profile that was done in PDFA pilot to be in line with the uh, Techno 10 and the Vera PDF uh, uh, project. And there are some other changes, smaller ones, but still uh, history and metadata, for example, is no longer validated. The uh, Tech Note states that default color spaces cannot be uh, inherited. It would lead us a little bit far to explain exactly what that means, but it's also a smaller point. Uh, named resources should not be used, not used for rendering uh, count as being used, um, and then compressed metadata. And what that actually says is that uh, compression for metadata is not allowed for metadata at page level. Now, this is a, a somewhat important point, so it deserves a little bit more of an explanation. What are we talking about? We're talking about XMP. XMP is metadata. Um, that can be stored in a PDF document. And what is uh, a little bit unique to PDF is that you can have more than one XMP 
packet inside of a PDF file. You can have XMP on the document level, but you can also have XMP on page level. You can have it attached to an image in a font, an ICC profile, and so on. And it's actually quite simple to have that um, if you have uh, a file in InDesign or Quark Express and you place uh, images or other PDF files in there and the things that you place already contain XMP, uh, there is at least a chance that you end up with a PDF file that contains multiple pieces of XMP information. Now, the problem with that is that XMP was created to in such a way that it can be extracted very easily from a file. Even if an XMP extractor doesn't understand the file format, it can still very easily find that XMP packet by simply scanning the file. Now, in PDF, that's not the case. Because you can have multiple XMP packets, um, you really need to understand the, the PDF formats to be able to identify which of those XMP packets is attached to the document. If you don't understand the PDF format, there is a risk that you'll simply scan the PDF and you'll end up with um, an XMP metadata packet that was attached to something placed in this document in InDesign, for example. And that's usually not what you're uh, looking for. So there is actually an advantage in this case that the metadata that is not at the document level is compressed. But PDF a, PDF A1 uh, in this case, is very clear. Metadata object stream dictionary shall not contain the filter key. And that's PDF Mongo Jumbo for you will not compress XMP metadata in a file. That's what that means. So it is not allowed. Even though PDF A pilot did it differently, um, the product had to be adjusted. If you now convert a file to PDF A with PDF A pilot, uh, the default option is that it re will remove compressed object metadata from the file, yeah? uh, except the document level uh, metadata. But in that way, you're sure that uh, this doesn't cause more problems uh, than there already were in that particular document. So a change, but it means that uh, even though the changes are not big, perhaps, that there are changes both on the checking side and on the uh, fixing side. All of the changes were uh, small, and only a, a few PDF files are negatively uh, affected. And actually, most of the ones that are affected, uh, it has to do with compressed metadata. OK, that was a rather technical um, uh, subject. So I suggest we uh, do something different for the next one and that I simply show that to you in the software. So I want to talk about decorating PDF documents. And what I will do is I will go to PDFA Pilot 7. And if you look at the switchboard in PDFA Pilot 7, you'll see that there is a new button in there and that new button is uh, called decorate the decorate button uh, has a number of functionalities that let you decorate in other words add content to a, a pdf document and i want to show you a uh, a couple of those i won't have time to show all of them but they all work along the same principles so that should be uh, relatively clear let me start with something uh, Simple, I have a, a letter here and I have a, a button here that says place folding marks. Uh, folding marks are these little lines that you can add so that you know where to fold this letter so that it fits into an uh, envelope. And it's a very easy one. There are no properties whatsoever that you uh, need to configure. So I can say, okay, I'll save that on my desktop and then um, I get these folding marks added to the uh, invoice. Very, very simple. Of course, the format of this letter that you have here is taken into account automatically. It will always place them so that the uh, division, uh, the, the height is divided by three. Let's put it that way. So let's take something that is uh, slightly more interesting and we'll go to um, add text. 
and I'm uh, just to show that. Uh, let me. Uh, well, we could say a PDFA pilot demo, and I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. I can choose what I want here in terms of color. So I could either take black or uh, colored. Let's take black in this case. And then I'm going to choose header center, which is the top of the document. And I'm going to ask to enlarge the document. So instead of adding the text here on top of the document, I'm going to first add white space on top and then put this text in the uh, white space that I have there. Okay, now let's see if we did everything correctly. I'm simply going to overwrite what I already have. So that was the white space that was added. And then the next step adds the text in the middle of the document. Now, I'm showing these things in the switchboard. Of course, these are also things that you can do in a profile, which means that uh, all of these techniques can easily be automated in PDFA pilot server or in the command line version uh, as well. Now, um, that's really nice. Now, let me change uh, some things here. I'm going to say confidential. Uh, we're going to make that uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, maybe we want uh, rotation for that. And let's uh, go back to a color, uh, maybe some, I don't know, Blum sounds nice. We'll add that. And then enlarge, um, uh, I'm going to uh, set to no, and I'm going to set this to the center of the page. So lots of uh, possibilities to, uh, to add this stuff. Uh, again, I'm going to overwrite what I already have, and uh, that will place the text in the middle of the uh, file that I have there. Now, why does it break? my line of text here. That's because in my settings, I still have a size specified as well. If I would set this to zero, it would not break the text line. Now, why do you have a, a size and an offset here? Well, of course, I can say center of page, but then offset with a certain uh, number of uh, millimeter, for example, yeah? Um, I can do that. Or I could say mouse selection. And that's a, a very nice new uh, addition uh, as well. So select the area where you want to uh, add something here. The coordinates that you have here automatically take the width and the height of that size that you've drawn and the position of the size that you've drawn. And now I can add uh, whatever text, whatever text I want to uh, add in this rectangle. Uh, maybe we shouldn't make it that incredibly big. And no rotation in this case. And let's see what that does. So you get my uh, my drift here. Um, it uh, it adds the text where I've uh, where I've said. Um, so for manual entry, this is of course very nice because you can look at the document, decide where you have white white space on the document, and then add. Uh, once you start with uh, automating things, it probably makes more sense to use uh, one of the other positions: header, center of the document, or footer. And then you still have uh, positioning and you still have a size if you want to have reflow of the text that you add as well. So that's uh, adding text to here. And I think this invoice has been uh, decorated enough by now. So uh, let me close that and uh, take something else. A uh, page number. Before I do that, and I'm not going to actually show this, but of course you can also add a date which is essentially the same as add text, except that uh, this will add the current date to uh, the area that you uh, select. Um, add page number is also essentially the same, but you have some, uh, some more options that I want to show. I can add a total number of pages here. I can specify what the text size should be. Uh, again, I can pick a color. 
um, determine where. So for page numbers, it probably makes the most sense to put them in the header and the footer, right? So those are the options that you have. Footer left, center, and right. Center is not bad. I can enlarge the page again, and then I can specify on which pages. So let's take seven. And if I execute that and place it on my desktop, I get a PDF file with the number of pages and the total number of pages. And when I scroll, you can see that it's added for the first seven pages, but it's not added for page number eight. Yeah. So very simple again, uh, but this gives you a way to quickly add uh, page numbering. What more? Well, all of this uh, so far was uh, text, so let's do something else. I can take a, uh, a logo, for example. And for that, we're going to go back to my previous example that I had. Uh, we'll take a PDF file that we want to add on top of there. And now, again, I can either do this in the area that I select with the mouse, or I can say, place this somewhere on the uh, the page. So in this case, I could say header left. Um, there is a size here from the, uh, the previous time I've run that, so I'm simply going to remove that. And now, let me show you the logo first. It's a bit of a faded version of the uh, the Kalas logo. And uh, when I say execute, you're going to see that it's going to be way too big, but that's to be expected. That's what I'm asking. I haven't given it a size at uh, this point in time. So let me do that. And then it will add the logo here in the size that this PDF file had. So whatever size PDF file you make, if you make a, a PDF of your logo that has the correct size, then PDF A Pilot will add that um, uh, to the uh, document. Now that's nice, but um, I really wanted it more in the background of the document as a watermark. And luckily we have that as well. So I can say browse and select the same logo. Scale to format. Placement is either on top or below, but I want to watermark a real one here. So I'm going to say below. And then when I run that and place it on the desktop, it adds that PDF document and it adds it in the background. So underneath all other uh, PDF objects I have on the page. Okay. So. A couple more, um, I can, um, so we're adding uh, graphical objects now. So let me see, letter background perhaps first, take my uh, nice um, invoice again, and then I'm going to select a background and say execute, and that adds a particular background to this uh, document. You can see that it doesn't completely fit for this particular document, right? But it adds a nice background to the document. And the backgrounds, of course, can be customized. I can either say, um, well, if I want to make it uh, a little bit better, I could uh, probably do this. And then uh, it gets added on top as well. Uh, so still not perfect so what if I, I want to make my own well instead of selecting one of the two examples that you have here uh, as you know in the switchboard there are often these um, additional things you can do in this action menu that you have here and manage letterhead templates will open a folder with pdf files inside what do you do if you want to add your own um, letterhead templates? Well, you save it as a PDF document. You put it in this folder. And then when you go back to um, uh, a PDF a pilot, 
and you reload it by going back and then going back to letter background, it will appear in that list and you can add your own uh, letter background to that. Yeah. So pretty simple to modify this to uh, have your own stuff uh, in there. There's so many of these. Let me take uh, the um, mail stamp. That's also a very nice one. So the idea of a mail stamp is that when you get papers from outside, for example, in many companies, there is a stamp placed on it that says when the document has uh, been accepted. So when it arrived um, and uh, perhaps where in which division it arrived or in which uh, office it arrived and so on. Well, you can do that by adding a, a stamp. So I will choose rectangular stamp now. I can say header left, for example, that's quite okay. I can say uh, internal number, that's just a number that you want and we can add uh, whatever we, uh, we want in there. Um, add the date to the stamp as well. And then again, you have a page range. So for example, if this is a multi-page document, you could add the stamp only to the first page in this particular uh, document. Um, this positioning, it's important to note that again, of course, I can do this with the mouse. So I could say, no, I want to place it, maybe here is better than in, in, the, uh, in the header. So I want to place it there. And now when I say execute, there we go. So it adds a, I should make my position a little bit lower to get the best result, but it adds a stamp to the document. Let's see if we can, while we're talking, we can do this again with the, uh, the round stamp uh, so that you see both of them. Yeah, so you add a stamp to the document. It says received, it has the current date on it. So the text is the same in both cases. It has that internal number that we specified on there uh, as well. Yeah? So those things have been added from the parameters that you have. And this template that you have here can be adjusted as well. So if I go into manage templates, then it will show me a a folder with two subfolders, one called round stamp and one called rectangular stamp. Well, these contain a PDF file that you could modify uh, for what you want. And then there is a little script that also allows you to quite easily modify the um, positioning of that text that we were talking about. So you can modify simply the background that you see here by modifying the stamp.pdf uh, that you see, or you could modify the uh, position of the text or both, or you could add different texts. Maybe it's not received in your case, but uh, something else, a different language or whatever. Um, because this is a template, uh, that can all be quite easily modified. Okay, so I think we have two more that we need to, to show. Uh, one is this add summary page. And now we're going a little bit beyond simply adding something to a page. Um, here I have a um, multi-page uh, document and I'm going to go to add summary page. I'm selecting a template. There is only one template in this case, but of course, again, you can say manage and then you can modify that template that you have here. And if I run that, there will be an extra white page added to the front of the document. So there is one additional page that gets added to the document. And then on that additional page, uh, information about the document gets added. So the idea behind this is, of course, a little bit the same as this uh, mail stamp, but instead of when a document comes in or is accepted, uh, instead of simply adding a, a mail stamp, a little stamp somewhere on the document, this summary page could add um, a whole bunch of additional information about the document. 
maybe not only where, uh, when it was uh, uh, accepted, but uh, information about the document, or there could be information about uh, who accepted it in there, the number of pages is in there, you could have the document size in there. So all of those things can be uh, added to the template so that they are shown on this uh, summary page. Uh, the default example is a white page, but of course, again, you could add branding information to that and have a page that reflects your company style, has logos on it or additional text on it, and so on and so on. Yeah. So this is, uh, like I said, similar to MailStamp, but it adds a lot more information. Along the same lines, and I'm going to skip that one because it is very similar, but along the same lines, um, th there is a way to um, insert information in the middle of a document with a divider page. If I have a 100-page document, maybe I want to insert, after every 10 pages, I want to insert a white page or a page with some additional artwork on it. And then that page can also contain additional information just as the summary page. So instead of in the front, a divider page would insert this into the document at certain locations. This also works with a template and that template can also be uh, modified or you can make multiple templates for this again. Yeah, So along the same lines. There is one last one that I do want to show, and that is this uh, move objects. And this is particularly nice because you can use the mouse again uh, for this. So if I take this invoice, I could say something happened to this. Um, uh, what, what happened? Well, this actually doesn't seem right. Uh, this is the name of the company, and then I have the address that should be uh, closer to each other. So I can say, well, these objects that I have here, and I'm only interested in text, or maybe I'm interested in everything, but in this case, I'm only interested in text. So these text objects that I select, they should be moved up. So uh, I want to move them by zero millimeter or point horizontally. So horizontally, they're in the right place. They are aligned with the rest of the um a letter but vertically i want them to go up by 10 millimeter uh, in this example uh, 10 millimeter a positive number means up a negative number would be moving down so we're actually moving it up and if i save that to my desktop it's going to show you that it can in fact move those things up. Again, those are things that you might do manually to quickly fix something, but um, those can also be things that you do uh, automatically by inserting that move objects um, action into a um, profile, uh, for example. So let me uh, go back here. So we've gone over uh, most of these that you've seen. Um, uh, I've already shown you that they can be uh, that they can be modified, and you can see uh, that they can be modified either by an HTML template or with uh, simply making a PDF. For this letter background, it was a PDF file. For the most of the others, mail stamp summary page, divider page. The modification is that HTML templates. Uh, so you could duplicate the one of the example templates that is already there and then simply modify what that does. Uh, um, and um, that, of course, makes it even more versatile because you can have your own company branded templates that get uh, added. Okay, that is uh, it for, uh, for me. Um, just to recap a little bit, we talked about two things. In PDFA Pilot 7, uh, the first one is compatibility with Vera PDF. Now, Vera PDF is, as I explained, this uh, European Union project where um, an online, uh, well, actually not online, it's not the most important part, where an open source, that's the most important part, open source validator for PDFA was created that can be used as a standard to 
test whether other validators do the right thing. It's only about validation, not about fixing or, or uh, converting. Um, PDFA Pilot 7 is completely compatible with that uh, uh, Vera PDF project and with all the findings from that project, including, as I explained, TechNote 10 developed by the PDF Association. Um, next to that, um, you have the new Decorate um, PDF documents option in the uh, uh, switchboard. So this nice little addition to the uh, switchboard where you have the possibility to add text, whether it is text or page number or date. Um, and you have the ability to add graphics to a PDF file, folding marks or a logo, an image, a watermark in the background, um, things like a, a mail stamp, a summary page at the front or divider pages somewhere in the middle of the document, um, or a, a letter background as well. And then the last little thing that you had here and that we showed was the move objects part. As I explained, those can be customized and they can be added into a profile for uh, automatic uh, uh, processing. Meanwhile, I think that all questions uh, were already answered during the uh, uh, presentation, which is very good. If you think of anything else that you want to ask after this presentation, don't hesitate to send us an email. For technical questions, you can reach us at support at 4 pscom or support at colorsoftware.com. Um, you can also write at info at 4 pscom or colorsoftware.com uh, with other questions. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, very simple, that is david at 4 pscom that works as well. And uh, don't hesitate, send that in and we will get back to you. The only thing that rests me then is to thank you very much for uh, listening in. Um, and I hope to see you all back uh, again soon for another webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>